coming up. Oregon mandates K-12 LGBT identity curricula. Baltimore kids can't read or do math, but a lot of people are getting paid. New study finds kids dream of being YouTube stars. Plus, we're answering your questions, and we've got some exciting news to share with you. It's all coming up next on The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Duke, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Every week, Katie and I cover those stories impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Greetings to our listeners, and if you haven't done so, please subscribe to The Dr. Duke Show audio podcast on iTunes, everywhere else as well. It's the best way to support the show, and it is utterly and completely free. Later on, we'll be answering some of your questions, and we'll be getting educated on the famed battle of Bunker Hill. So stick around for that. But first, some exciting news we want to share with you. In two weeks, The Dr. Duke Show will be upping the ante by bringing you a daily show. We're going to have a daily show Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. That's 15 minutes long, plus the usual longer story on Thursday. Very exciting new format, we think. So you go, a little bit of Dr. Duke and Katie every day, with Thursday shows being the regular length. Uh, we think we're going to get you more stories every week in shorter time periods. Each episode will re- be released at a brand new time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So get ready for your daily dose of The Dr. Duke Show podcast, which will be Monday through Thursday, and then stick around for Katie. Katie's Healthy Republic uniquely on Friday, as it has always been. So to repeat, starting Monday, August 19th, we will be expanding the Dr. Duke show to four days a week at the new time of 6 p.m. Central Standard. You know, we heard a lot from our California friends over the last few weeks. And, you know, California, we don't mean to abandon you, California moms and dads, but we keep hearing, help us. You got to stand behind us. You got to support our petitions. You got to help us fight back. Yes, 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 California, I get it. But let me simply point this out. If your kids were in a burning school building and the state of California said, we're not going to put the fire out, we're going to add gasoline to it, would you turn around and say to us, okay, Dr. Duke Show, we want you to help get our kids out of that school. We want you to help fight schools, public, uh, fires in public schools generally. We want you to get on board and sign a petition. No more fires in public schools. Great, we'll help you. But would you leave your kid in the school while it was burning No, you wouldn't. California schools are burning down. The education in California, which is going to be the mandate for American education moving forward, it's already happening in places like Colorado and New York, and as we're going to talk to you about in one minute, Oregon, too. You can't leave your kids in the schools. We can't help, the, you can't help your kids now. You, you can petition and you can run for school board election and you can try to vote out Republican, uh, Democrat candidates. You can petition the State Board of Education. But for the first, now and for the foreseeable future, your kids are going to get a crappy, underperforming, sexualized, transgender education and there's nothing you can do about it. R- witness Oregon. So Oregon is uh, now mandating K through 12 LGBT identity curricula in, of all places, civics and geography. So the Democrat controlled house passed legislation. It's going to ensure that LGBTQ issues are included in this public school curriculum. And it's called House Bill 2023. It indicates that public school children will be exposed will be exposed to content regarding sexuality in all courses dealing with civics, economics, geography, government, and history. Let that sink in, mom and dad of California and mom and dads across the country. You think you're gonna opt your kids out of this? California's already told you there is no opt-out and there is no opt-out here in Oregon. There will be no opt-out in New York and we know that there's no opt-out coming in Colorado. Just talked to a a Colorado activist this week. We'll release that video next week. It's just as bad in Colorado as it is in California and maybe worse. You can't opt your kids out. Oh, and how's this for a radical kick in the bloomers? The same public school system that refused for 30 years now to teach your kids civics, Mm -hmm. nothing about the Constitution, nothing about the Federalist Papers, nothing about the debates over the founding of the country, nothing about civic responsibility and and three branch legislative branch, none of that stuff, right? None about the rights and responsibilities of voters. We won't teach it. Now they're teaching civics again so they can turn civics into the civics of lesbian, gay, transsexual history. Mm -hmm. Geography, you ask, well, Dr. Pesta, (laughs) 
Didn't geography used to be about state capitals and rivers and mountain ranges? Yeah, it did. This is what's called cultural geography. I promise you, when your kids take geography class in your local Oregon school, they will still not know what the capital of Ohio is, let alone the capital of Oregon in Oregon. <laughs> they won't know that, right? But what they will know is what we call cultural geography. In other words, migrations of transgenders across various state lines. The idea of homosexual migrations, right? Population bases, all of this kind of stuff. This is literally what they call cultural geography. It has nothing to do with what you and I learned in geography in the same way that this kind of civics has nothing to do with what you and I consider civics to be. But they admitted it, in, at least in this. So they said that the roles and contribution, roles and contributions mm -hmm. of these historical personages, uh, personages, I guess, would be highlighted in coursework for their sexuality and gender identities rather than their accomplishments right. or contributions. So the accomplishment is being rather transgender, than, right? Yeah. The accomplishment is being gay or transgender. That is, That's the accomplishment. That, so, and so you're so not gonna learn about boring old heterosexual accomplishments. Yeah. And what this leads to, and we've said this in the California stories, what this leads to is inventing gay and transgender people from the past, right? Yep. Because going back, oh, I don't know, three years, it's awfully hard to find throughout the whole history of Western culture real people who identified as transgender because nobody did because it's a stupid made up thing that denies science, denies biology, denies physiology, right? It's something that in our vanity and our wealth and our reckless postmodernism, we created out of whole cloth just a few years ago. And because of that, you will not find transgenders in the Victorian period. You will not find colonial era transgenders. So what you're going to have to do is any person who didn't marry, any person who didn't have children. Well, Emily Dickinson, the great American <laughs> poet, she never married. And for a long time, we assumed she was a lesbian because, you know, we got to out people. We got to find in order to teach this curriculum, which, as you're seeing here, is not just health. It's not just human growth and development. It's not just sexuality lessons in a sex ed class. No, this is part of everything you do. And ask yourself this too, Emily Dickinson. She didn't marry, so the lesbians appropriated her for a long time. This is what you're going to have to see happening. Going back through history, any place where you can't definitively nail down heterosexuality, you're going to assume homosexuality or transgenderism. And the other thing about this is, you're gonna spend all this time in all these different classes meeting all of these radical sex standards that are, again, based not on achievement or merit or historical relevance, based only on your sexual preference. You can't learn about anybody else. Well, and we've talked about this, about how, like in literature class, how they can't read full books anymore. And mm -hmm. teachers say, oh, we don't have time to teach all this. We just don't have the time. Now they are mandating, in again, this is in your history classes or social studies classes or civics, by 2026, all textbooks and instructional materials for these courses have to include all of these groups. Let's count them off. Perspectives of individuals who are Native American, African, Asian, Pacific Islander, Chicano, Latino, or Middle Eastern descent are women, uh, disabled, immigrants or refugees, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And we know that's going to have to be amended because you don't have the A, Q, T, Niner plus in there. How many, I, don't, I already lost count, how many groups, but none of that. None of that matters because as long as you're ticking those boxes, that's all they care about. And you can't possibly spend enough hours in the day on those subjects. No, you, you can't. You can't possibly do it, no. which means you cannot teach any history that's not. Yeah. So, so in other words, unless you teach history from radical, progressive, and primarily sexual categories, unless you do that, racial and sexual categories that aren't white, that aren't Western, that aren't American, that aren't Christian. True. What, what do you got <laughs> left? True. What do you got left? Yeah. This entire thing is a radical progressive hijacking your kids. Please explain to me, West Coast, how your kids can stay in these schools and learn anything meaningful. It is one long, from pre-K all the way through the end of high school, it is one long series of indoctrination. Low achievement, low reading, low literacy, but it's all going to be the progressive stuff. And when they finally get done with that, they'll fit right into your West Coast colleges. They'll walk right into colleges. In fact, I don't even know why you need colleges anymore. Everything that college is doing in four years to your kids, they're going to, be st they're going to start doing it now in preschool. So what's the point of college? Yeah. Well, and we're going to tie it back into your some 
summarization, I guess, of California and how California and what they're doing. And mom and dads, we heard how many reports of, well, that's again, that's California, the Republic of California, it's not going to happen here, blah, blah, blah. The summary of this specific bill for Oregon cited California as a mm-hmm. model to follow mm-hmm. when reviewing whether their K-12 textbooks should reflect these histories. And Colorado said the same thing, and New York said the same thing, and you think, oh, but this is just the progressive oh, states. Oh, of course. It's Wouldn't happen them. in rural states like Colorado, right? Oh. No, no, it would never happen oh. there. But now it'll, it'll never happen in Oklahoma. Or Texas. No, it never happened in Texas. No, 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 no. And, and you know, along with this story, we have a parallel story. And this blows me kind of away. Teen activists score mental health days for Oregon students. Woohoo! So now in Oregon, a group of students have decided that in the name of mental health, we ought to let students just not come to school because, you know, they're having a bad mental health day. No, this won't be abused at all, right? No, not in the least. Uh, so, it, and what I love about this is the fact that it's proposed by kids means it's serious. Oh, that, that what's really serious about this is student activism. For right? serious. Right? So, I mean, take a look serious. at this, right? Oregon will allow students to take mental health days just as they would sick days, expanding the reasons for excused school absences to include mental and or behavioral health. Look, I have a behavioral health problem. I am addicted to sitting in my basement in my bare feet eating Dere- Cool Ranch Doritos and playing video games. Mm, so I, in know. order to deal with my health, my behavioral issue, I'm just going to have to call him once a week and take a mental health day yep. so I can sit, sit down in the basement and play Call of Duty all day. That's for me. That's right. Your mental health this Wednesday. This literally is what they're doing. Oregon will allow students to take mental health days just as they would sick days, expanding the reasons for excused school absences to include mental or behavioral health under a new law but but don't call it coddling the argue says don't you dare suggest that we're telling kids now besides all the random sick days now you can just do a mental health day two or three times a month if you want well and the thing it was proposed by uh Haley hardcastle she's an 18 year old from a portland suburb of sherwood and she's the one who helped champion this mental health mm. bill and she said that her and some of the other students were partly motivated or fully motivated by the national youth-led movement that followed last year's Parkland, Florida shooting. Mm -hmm. I somehow can't believe that at all. She says, we were inspired by Parkland in the sense that it showed us that young people can totally change the political conversation. Just like those movements, this bill is something completely coming from the youth. If you have to say it's completely coming from the youth, it's not completely coming from the youth. (laughs) And that's the point. Why is this now law? Because the youth want it. So, and and let's be very clear, you, you just hinted at this, Katie. The fact that these kids come up with this, well, why is it that all this youth legislation, whether it's mm-hmm. the idiot Parkland kids, right, uh, da- uh, David Hogg, did I get that right? You got David it. Hogg and, and all those kids out there demand, lying, making up statistics, going on radio programs, and not being called out for their lies by people like CNN's Brian Settler, all that. Now, why is it, you know, given that these kids are such activists, that I can't think of a single instance in any school where any kind of non-liberal student youth movement's been adopted. Notice how, Mm. is it just Mm. a coincidence, Katie, that all of this youth-led activism mimics entirely what the the teachers want. The politics of the teachers, the politics of the teachers' unions, that's always the youth activism that seems to find its way into law. Yeah, and sadly, Oregon is... The suicide is Oregon's second leading cause of death. You wonder why these kids in these public schools, they, they're not getting an education. They're not being exposed to great ideas. They're not reading great books. It's one nonstop lesson in political correctness about how the world, how, e, how racist everybody is, how everything is white supremacy, how everything's tyranny, oppression, how capitalism is even, and we're destroying the planet and the environment. Everybody wants to hold you down. And then we wonder why these kids take their own lives. And the response to this, quite literally, is don't go to school. Yeah, Stay home. And you know what? On that level, maybe that is the thing that's going to save the most lives. Maybe Maybe coming full circle around with this, maybe we should let kids out of school every day. Maybe that's the way to save their lives. Instead of just three or four times a year or three to four times a month, what if we just, in the name of mental health and their own welfare, and their own educational survival. Maybe we let the kids out of public school all year round. One more thing on this, though, to go back to, so parents understand, in addition, Oregon's NAEP scores, their National Report Card scores, it's not like, well, maybe, you know, they're, they're still going to get grades this, the, have, taking that mental health day, then it'll help them when they're in school and they'll be able to, you know, do things better, read better, do better math. No, it's not going to happen because we know across the nation, uh, Oregon specifically, their eighth grade national average, because we they don't have the 12th grade, is a 36 
percent proficiency in reading and 34 yep. percent in math so because got- well because as they said the teens this year were quite active at the capitol unusually active and that's mm. what they were doing is trying to get themselves out of the school and see that is the point it doesn't matter that only 36 percent of our kids can read and do math it doesn't matter what matters is that these kids care that these kids aren't going to school they're proposing more legislation to stay out of school they're not t- they don't have to be literate they're activists okay. this is this is what we want as a culture a bunch of young kids with no education and no skills highly politicized getting laws passed that's what we want and again just so happens it's the very laws and policies that the progressive teachers want and, surprise and that's why we put our morality in, into government. We, we trust the government to determine mm-hmm. what's moral. Well, the same thing types of things are happening over in Baltimore where we know that kids can't read, they can't do math, and uh, now their employees were finding out statistics about how the employees are basically ripping off the taxpayers mm-hmm. because of it. There's been a lot of hoopla, I'll say, a lot of talk uh, this past week, of, and it all started, of course, with President Trump putting out a tweet um, about Baltimore mm-hmm. saying that Baltimore is a rat-infested city. And this directed attention at Representative Elijah Cummings, who's been there for almost 30 years. Um, And so, of course, somehow it's racist. Uh, The tweet says, Rep. Elijah Cummings has been a brutal bully shouting and screaming at the great men and women of Border Patrol about conditions at the southern border, when actually his Baltimore district is, in all caps, far worse and more dangerous. His district is considered the worst in the USA. As proven last week during a congressional tour, the border is clean, efficient, and well-run, just very crowded. Cummings' district is a disgusting rat and rodent-infested mess. If he spends more time in Baltimore, maybe he could help clean up this very dangerous and filthy place. What's wrong with that statement? I mean, it, you, Trump is racist. Other clearly. than the fact that Cummings is black and Trump is Trump, and that right? rats actually they caught on camera and running rat, across. Well, and the thing, accurate. That, the thing that gets me, you got the former disgraced mayor of Baltimore on camera from about a year ago talking about all the rats, all the rats that walking down a, a, a feces rat infested street and complaining about the smell. This is a woman, the mayor of uh, the former mayor of Baltimore, of course, whose corruption charges forced her to finally step down. Baltimore is like so many of these big urban cities. They are run by uh, liberals, oftentimes in, in southern states. They're run by African Americans, as you see. It, it's Baltimore, been the case in Baltimore for a long time. You know, the, the, the fact is, is that we've reached the point as a culture where to point out failure, if that failure comes from progressives, is racism. Yeah. It's another way to, fr- to phrase this. And are we surprised? Are we really surprised that Baltimore can't educate its kids? Like all big cities, the, the numbers, 30, they'd love to get to 36% proficiency. They, 36% percent proficiency in math and reading in Baltimore would be double where they are now, more or less. Yeah, we've reported on this many different times, all the the chaos that has happened, whether it be violence against teachers from students we reported on, but specifically Alex Newman, and you talked about um, their NAP scores and what's happening. And back in 2017, that's most recent data, uh, Alex Newman did the data and they have something called project baltimore and they found that 13 schools within baltimore didn't have a single not one student proficient in math not Not one one. of 13 of the 39 schools so one third of them couldn't produce one single kid who's proficient in math and another six of those schools had one percent. One percent. These are so. primarily, oftentimes, black and minority kids. You've got black and minority politicians. You've got liberals destroying the future for these children under their care. And their only response to any criticism is you're a bigot. This is the same organization. They actually hired D. Ray McKesson. Remember him? Yeah. He's, he has no qualifications other than being a black lives agitator. Simply by, you know, being at the front and center of these Black Lives Matter protests, which are themselves full of crap. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, On on that alone, he was hired as a human capital officer. The chief one. A chief human capital officer in Baltimore schools making in 2017 one hundred and sixty five thousand plus dollars a year. And all he did was continue his Black Lives Matter social media work and dumped it into the schools. In other words, again, ba- Oregon, remember, we're on the other side, of the co- other side of the country now. What did McKesson do for all that money? He didn't make your kids read better in Baltimore. He didn't improve the conditions of the school. He just, Black Lives Matter, politicized those kids. Well, and then shortly after he got hired, he went to a protest, got himself arrested in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and uh, he defended himself in front of the school board, but then he had to uh, resign eventually. And after his one year of being there, he, he, he described it as being an incredible yes. experience. It was an incredible experience for him to be 
in Baltimore tumbling down the schools even and, and further. And explain to me, I think the public schools, outside of politics, the public schools are the only place in America where you can repeatedly fail and demand and get more money. And you may say, well, uh, well absolutely, because teachers don't make enough money. Mm. They never make enough money. The average average teacher is making 58000 plus. I'll take that. I can tell you. I, the, I will take that right I now. I can tell you in my English department, we're right full of professors with PhDs. That's more than most professors in my department, again, with 12 and 13 years of graduate school make. And that's not counting the perks and the benefits and the, the lavish retri retri uh, retirement yeah, yeah. programs that these, all pe these people have. Again, why, why? It's the same problem. In the same way you can't criticize Elijah Cummings, who's the longest serving politician in politics. He He's not responsible for any of this. The Baltimore mayor, the Baltimore school uh, superintendent, D. Ray McKess, none of these people are responsible. Nope. This is, you know whose fault this is? This is white privilege. Oh, of This course. is white supremacy's fault. So give us more money, shut up, our kids will get dumber, but yeah. more politicized. And ah. what's the difference again between Baltimore and Oregon? Fewer rats? Is that, is that what we got going on here? Well, it depends mm. on how you define rat. The little furry yeah. things. I'll take the little furry creatures running up and screwing up the pipes to these educrat rats who have no interest in helping your kids. They want to sexualize and politicize them for their own partisan politics. Remember Red for Ed, oh. right? Let's go <laughs> commie for Ed. Let's walk out of school in the middle of a semester, LA. get 8, 10, 12, 14% raises, and get back into the classroom and performance doesn't, inclu doesn't improve one iota. And meanwhile, you blame the moms and dads who you tell you're not allowed at our school, we don't care what your input is, you're not gonna opt your kids out, we're not gonna listen to what you have to say, you don't get to tell us what curriculum we're gonna teach your kids, we don't, you're not gonna tell us what we're gonna teach your kids about sex when, but it's your fault when our program fails to give your kids an education. Bigot homophobes. So uplifting. Uh, out of the schools, but into another educational resource, the library. So the newest conference they just had is teaching our librarians how to sneak drag queens past parents. And you may be saying to yourself, wait a minute, I've heard this story before. And that would be because we reported on this a few weeks ago about how the American Libraries Association was putting out advice to the librarians about how to do this, how to sneak this LGBTQ niner material into your libraries. But now the national, the organization's national conference gave the librarians more tips and tricks of uh, how to get drag queen story times into public libraries despite objections of patrons. I really, really, really hope this sinks in now because here you have professional librarians whose job it is most professional librarians work in school districts, right? There just aren't that many Washington, D.C. libraries of Congress out there. Yeah. Oftentimes, you, the, and the same people who train professors by and large train, train, train librarians. And do you see what the purpose of this is? The purpose is find ways to radicalize your kids in spite of you. They're, they don't care what you think. They, in fact, they are actively working against your values. How do we, in spite of mom and dad, get this information into the hands of our kids? How do we, and the drag queen thing is something that we've talked about a lot in this show, and I, I repeat myself because no one is, I, have you ever heard another person raise this issue? or this comment. I have never heard anybody else bring this up. In all the media talking about drag queens, if what you want to do is convince little children that transgender people are normal, everyday, just like us people, why are you bringing in adult men flamboyantly dressed in costumes? Why are you bringing in flamboyantly dressed adult men in kabuki makeup and uh, diamond-studded banana slings? Why are you doing that? Because you're not convincing little kids that transgenderism or gender confusion or gender itself, you're not convincing kids. Why not bring in the librarian who happens to be transgender? Why not bring in the accountant, right, who's gay? If that's what you want to do is show four and five and six-year-olds that these people are perfectly normal. No, no, no. You bring in the most flamboyantly out there example because what you're trying to do in the schools is not normalize or legitimize anything. What you want to do is show kids at a very early age that gender and biology itself don't matter. When you're bringing in men dressed up outrageously like women, caricatures of women, you're not doing this to mainstream tolerance. What you're trying to convince little, little children of is that gender and biological male and female are utterly meaningless categories. This is brainwashing 101. There's nothing to it. And the American Library Association is now telling you, we're going to find ways to get it in even when you try to pull it out. 
And they spent this entire week-long conference in Washington, D.C., close to the Capitol there, with more than 21,000 attendees learning all of this. They had workshops that were called Queerness in Comics, uh, A Child's Room to Choose, Encouraging Gender Identity and Expression in School and Public Libraries. They had Reading the Rainbow, Teaching Kids About Pride and LGBTQ Plus History, because we know that Oregon's going to get it, uh, and Telling Stories, Expanding Boundaries, Drag Queen Story Times in Libraries. So what they had is, uh, just if you've... Ha- attended any conference before they do you know workshops and breakouts and all this um one workshop was titled are you going to tell my parents the minor's right to privacy in the library so it's i got this book over here it's lgbtq queerness come on over and you don't have to tell your parents about it so they're trying to teach librarians how to teach the minors that you don't have to report anything back to your parents and nine years ago before we had this show before we had this studio nine years ago when we were crossing the country talking about common core we pointed out something that when common core came into the schools and all the common core pedagogy and textbooks were being flooding the schools at that point, American li- high school and middle school librarians were pulling off the shelves of their school libraries, libraries the classics. Mm-hmm. Shakespeare was vanishing, all the Odyssey and the Iliad. They were, they were literally having book sales where they were giving away the great literature of Western culture to be replaced with all of this gender confusion, Johnny has two mommies, I'm jazz kind of uh, stuff. Lumberjanes, L- right. pregnant, butch, mm-hmm. my brother's husband. And I remember distinctly eight years ago when we were talking about this on the show, people were saying, no, this is ridiculous. They are not doing this. This is not, this is, <laughs> you're being paranoid. They're not emptying out the libraries of the classics to, rep- what, n- here's the thing. In libraries, if your kid goes into a library now, they're not going to be able to, a school library, they're not going to be able to find Dickens' Great Expectations. They're not going to be able to find a copy of the Odyssey. All the books that they can read are going to be these radical politicized books. So the entire libraries, and you ask yourself, what in the world does librarian science have to do with promoting homosexuality and transgenderism? Well, what does civics and geography have to do about it either? Nothing. But every ass, you will be made to care. Every aspect of your kid's education, even support staff like librarians now, are finding ways to make everything they do every day Nothing more than this radical sexual revolution. Heck, it's going one step further. Grocery stores Mm -hmm. now have to care because Whole Foods is jumping on board with this sponsoring of drag shows. And nothing sounds less appetizing to me than that, having Whole Foods being a primary sponsor of a drag queen story hour. But this is what's happening. It happened in Atlanta where there was an event that was endorsed by the city's mayor. Her name is Kesha Lance Bottoms. And the NBA's Atlanta Hawks, NFL's Atlanta Falcons, they all got behind it to have this event at City Hall in June because it had been canceled from happening at the library. So even when we fight, we're going to fight the, you know, drag queens at the library, they're moving to Whole Foods now. I'm less worried about Whole Foods than I am. The NBA and and the the NFL NFL now are helping to abet Whole Foods into providing drag queen shows for little kids because enough moms and dads were angry about it at the library that they had to stop it. The NFL. L and with a name like Lance Bottoms, Kesha the mayor Lance of Bottoms. Atlanta. I mean, that's that's a, that would be a perfect drag queen name. Remember, I tell you that everyone's last name when they get stupid reflects who they I are. Mean, wouldn't Lance that make Bottoms the, would that not has make the, to be in this the position, perfect this drag role. queen name? Ben Dover, Lance, Lance Bottoms. Bottoms. Would That'd that be not good. be perfect? Bend over, bend over. Well, maybe it'll happen. But the One Million Moms, uh, they've organized a boycott of Whole Foods. Not that I shop at Whole Foods anyway. Jeez, their, their prices are ex- exorbitant. Uh, but One Million Moms has organized a boycott of Whole Foods, and they already have 9,000 signatures. So there's something. And what does it tell <laughs> Again, what does it tell you that the NFL and the NBA, mm-hmm. it's not just Silicon Valley, it's not just Google and Facebook and Twitter. It's it America. Is, it's, it's the NFL. It's the NBA. It is, these are the companies now mm-hmm. that are underwriting this radical sexual, re- sexual revolution for your kids. And they don't care what you think, mom and dad. They just don't care. This has become so, um, it has become such a faux cause celeb that to not support this stuff makes you a bigot in the corporate world. So you're going to support it. And if that means circumventing parents' rights, you're going to do it at every turn. We have a a study, a new study out, that said kids are dreaming of being not astronauts, not musicians, not teachers, not any of that stuff. They want to be professional YouTubers. That's where we're at in 2019. So if your little five-year-old comes up to you and says, I want to be a professional YouTuber, you cut the cord right there and you say the Internet's down. 
So what did you want to be? I guess I had this question for you. What did you want to be when you grew up? Do you remember? You know, I don't remember. I I, I it was pretty amorphous. I remember taking that. Stu- remember those amorphous. Remember those. No, as a in child, my I mind, was amorphous. My, my not my, my gender oh, was. Are was you a, my gender was amorphous when I was a little boy. <laughs> no, I remember specifically taking that stupid um, that four hundred oh, yeah. word survey thing you had to do to find yeah. out what you were supposed to do. And mine kept coming. I took it. Took I think I took it in, my, in eighth grade. I took it again yeah, junior year of high school. Seventh grade, I think I took it. Yep. And both times it came back farmer. You're the least likely. Exactly. Least. Exactly. The least. This is why this is all just crap. hard work. Crap. Well, it's not even hard <laughs> work. It, I think it was Getting because up for my profile hours. was like, leave me alone. I didn't want to be around people. That do, makes sense. Do you like to be alone a lot? Do be you, with your soil. Do you get easily annoyed by people? Do, do people bother you? Talk to and the of cows. course, I'm checking. Do you hate, do you hate <laughs> parties? Yes, indeed. All that stuff. So on the basis of that, I think they had me at like farming potatoes in a, on, on the Ooh. island of Elba somewhere where I was completely Maybe beets. Solo. You could have been a beet farmer. A beet farmer. There you go. Beet Grow, the perfect. He grows great beets, but lousy hemp. So, Lego surveyed 3,000 children ages 8 to 12, and they actually surveyed ones in the U.S., the U.K., and China, and it was very interesting to see the breakdown in difference in culture. 326 parents of kids, kids ages 5 to 12 were also put in here, so they got, a, a, I guess, as diverse as they could of uh, information. And almost one-third of these kids said that they wanted to be a YouTuber, and only 11% wanted to be an astronaut. But... Those who are at least in China, 50% of those kids wanted to, to be an astronaut. Maybe they're around technology so much they're like, I don't, I don't want YouTube. <laughs> but the American kids, yeah, a vlogger, which means like video logger or a YouTuber. YouTuber. They want to be famous. Yep. Oh, and, so, and they want to be teachers too. Hey, I right? wanted to be a teacher. Mm-hmm. It, I guess I go back to my story. Right. I know we'll come back to it, but it's the same thing at the university level. The fact that college kids admire the professors more than other people, the fact that these kids want to be teachers, it shows you what kind of impact teachers have. And what used to be you know, a benign love for somebody's enthusiasm in front of the classroom is being guided now by ideology, right? I mean, we, we talked about it in the Oregon story, the fact that uh, all of these young student initiatives just happen to mimic what the professors and the teachers themselves want. Same thing here, you know? Uh, and, and musician, the one thing I'll say about this, both the American and British kids and the Chinese kids had in their top five things they wanted to be musicians. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you, for the UK and British kids, that's banging on a drum, rapping, or screaming into a microphone. I'll bet you for those Chinese kids, it's playing the viola or the cello in classical music, right? Well, that's all so they get to hear. That's, that's all, all they're allowed all right. to hear. Good for them. Yeah, yeah. It takes more them. talent, I would if say. There, I suppose if there's one positive thing you can say about the Chinese Communist government, and I'm not even going to say there's one positive thing, but at least those kids listen to classical music. Yeah, we'll give them that. Um, we also found uh, in two, a 2017 survey by Fatherly had done a survey of 1,000 U.S. kids and that were under the age of 12, and they found back then the most popular was doctor and then being a veterinarian, engineer, police officer, teacher. But where it's only two years later and all of a sudden, boom. Be famous on the YouTube. You think about these influencers, mm-hmm. these so-called influencers, and Lori Loughlin's, Loughlin's kids, right? Oh, jeez. This, this vapid, spoiled little brat who wanted to go to college for the partying and not for anything else, whose mom uh, compromised her entire financial future to buy this kid into the school that she was going to. This kind of garbage. I mean, but this is what, what passes, how these vloggers are getting comped at, at spas, uh, at, yep. you know, uh, Sandals Jamaica. Sandals Jamaica. All inclusive. <laughs> They're getting comped at this stuff because they're video influencers. They're spoiled little kids who simply have a platform and a a pretty face who tell other dumb little kid followers where they should go and what they should do. Uh, And I go back to this again, whether it's this story or it's one we'll come back to again, this idea that college kids admire their professors more than just about anybody else. This is not healthy. It's not a good thing. Uh, We wonder why overwhelmingly when our kids graduate from college or graduate from high school, their politics mimics the politics of the teachers. It's bad for everybody. And I only ask you, can you imagine Imagine if our professors were as right wing as they are left wing now and kids were graduating and immediately joining the GOP, there would be a crisis, a crisis in the New York Times about how our schools were being co-opted for politics. As long as the left does it, it seems perfectly normal. Yeah, and you have all these kids who are just spending all their time sitting indoors, playing on YouTube, trying to be influencers. And you wonder why when they hear stories about 10-year-olds who are getting charged with assault for simply actually being outside playing the, the dangerous game that is dodgeball. Yeah, we had a 10-year-old kid who was hit in the face, and his mother is uh, filing charges, 
and the school had the kid who threw the ball arrested and charged with a felony is what ended up happening. Well, the kid was charged with a, fe a felony. B to me, th th this is a shocking story, right? Kids playing the equivalent of dodgeball during recess. One kid gets hit in the, hit in the head, suffers injuries. Uh, he the mom charges the kid. The kid is charged by the police with a quasi-felony. Uh, and to me, the big story here is the school. Because rather than defend the kid, rather than keep the kid away from dodgeball, because the kid who was hit in the head with the ball had a, hear, a series of, of problems like this, right? Yeah, it said, so... It's in Michigan. To, yeah, to go back with the story, it happened at Erickson Elementary School in Canton Township, Michigan. And this, the, the actual incident happened back in April, but now it's... Um, hit in the courts. Yeah, it's hit in the courts, and the mom of the child who is the aggressor, I guess, put up a, a post about it, so that's how people are finding more about it. Um, but her child, Bryce, was the one who was suspended from the school, and they were playing dodgeball, and the kid who got hit, the victim, if you will, the injured student, had a pre-existing condition of chronic brain stem infliction. Why, oh why, was the kid playing dodgeball? Eh. You always tried to get out of, I didn't, but a lot of kids tried to get out of dodgeball for, I have a cough, I can't tie my shoe. Like, they tried to get out. If you actually have chronic brainstem infliction, hmm, dodgeball does not seem like the most important yeah, thing to be doing. Yeah, and the mom had, this is why, but this is a school story. This is a school, it's not the police who overreacted. It's not the mom who's, be, the mom who's behaving like a bit of a baby, I think, in, in, with regards to this. Uh, you, I don't know why she's suing the kid when this is the school's, fault or the family. Uh, they knew this kid had a problem. Mom knew this kid had a problem. Why was he out there playing dodgeball? Where was the school in this? The school had a, it's not as if the, the mom hadn't warned the school about this. And so, you know, the school's response to this is interesting. Uh, we had nothing to do with this. This is not our fault. We have no responsibility in this. We can't talk about it. Well, they so they suspended the kid who yeah. threw the ball because they of did. course it goes to, this is what was in our handbook as a thing. But then once it hit the courts, now they're like, oh, it, it's out of our hands. We can't do anything about it. That's where they're at. The school's like, well, now that it's in the juvenile court system, um, I'm, we're not allowed to intervene mm. with it and whatnot. The thing that's interesting for me, too, is the mother of the boy who was actually injured um, said that he had gotten a concussion and he had some facial um, damage, a bruised nose, um, and that he's been victimized before. And again, you say, why didn't the school take care of it then? And again, how many times does this kid have to play dodgeball, get hit in the face well, for you to be like, hmm? This is going to sound a little insensitive, but doesn't the kid know better? That's what I'm saying. If he's 10 kid, years old as well. He should He's know, 10 years like, old. He's, it's happened to him twice already. Why yeah. is he playing this game? Yeah. And the mom said, um, I tried not to let it get to this point. My son was hit twice in the face with a ball, a ball previously due to this. Here's what I find interesting. The child, so the one who got suspended, apologized to my son. And my son, the, one, the victim, said, Mom, it's okay. We're still going to be friends. So the kids worked it out. But now, of course, we have to make charges and kid has to get suspended. And no, yeah. First of all, this is called, uh, it's called, it's a version of dodgeball called tips. tips. Do you know what that is? I, I tried I looking it up. We played good old fashioned dodgeball. Yeah, me too. I so, loved it, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it was loved nice it, by the way. And it was those big spongy balls, right? Mm. Uh, and, and, you, and, there were, and you couldn't cross the middle line. So it's not like people were with, oh, yeah. in, throwing balls this close to you. Wow. Uh, so the idea, but yeah, what, what is, it didn't, we can talk about all the angles of this. I, I, why was that little kid playing when he knew better? Why did the um, uh, school allow this to go on? W were they not paying attention? Uh, what's going on here with the mom who's decided, why is the kid who threw the ball the one bearing the brunt of this? But to me, this is a school story, right? It, it, on every level, this is school malfeasance. Uh, and so if you've got a kid like this and you've got a situation like this and it happened twice before, I, I just don't see how the school shouldn't be the primary target here for any retribution uh, from the angry parent. All right, it's time once again where we look deep into our crystal ball and answer the world's deep burning questions. Now, since we've had a jam-packed show, we're only going to answer just a few of your questions today. And we're going to start with April from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, who says, You talk a lot about homeschooling on the show, but what do you recommend for higher education in the face of all of the problems in our colleges and university?" What other options are there for high-quality education degrees for higher education? This is a complicated question. It would take me an hour to give you a really good answer. I will simply say a couple of things. One, no kid, no kid, no kid needs college at 17 years old. So I would not send my kid right from high school to college. I wouldn't do it. 
take a year or two and have the kid live with you, um, have him work and save some money so that if he does at, at 19 or 20, he wants to go back to college for some reason, he can pay for it, right? He's got money. No one needs it at 17. They're too young. And when they take him at 17 and dump him into the dorms, that's when they really lose those, you lose those kids politically and morally. So no one needs college at 17. Work, or if you have to do it, have the kid live with you. Get his associate's degree at the local community college where there are no dorms. Lot cheaper, get your gen ed stuff out of the way. 17 to 19, 18 to 20 in there. Let him get his gen ed stuff out of the way by working at home. Let him save that, a lot of the money he makes while working part time so that if he decides he needs the final two years of that degree, He's 20, 21, he's a little bit older. Uh, he's got some money in the bank, so he's not getting in debt. And he only has to go to the big campuses for his major, right? So those are some things you can do. And I, the other thing I've already hinted at you about, don't ever let your kids live in the dorms. You think the classrooms are bad. You think the professors in the classrooms are bad, and they are. But what happens in the classroom is being paid attention to. We've done dozens of stories of college kids cop of, you know, recording what their professors are saying. People are paying attention to the classroom. No one's paying attention to the dorms. And the dorms is where the socialization goes on. The dorms are where they're being bullied into being trans-friendly friendly and uh, gay-friendly and they're, they're having their traditional notions and values kicked out of their heads in the dorms. So those are just a couple short things. I mean, it's, it's a comprehensive question you asked, but that's a place to start. I just want to add on to that. Uh, the question being high quality education degrees, just take off degrees. Where can you get a high quality education? You don't have to go to these colleges. We, as much as we just hate it on YouTubers, YouTube does have a lot of resources. Get the actual book from the libraries, ignore the drag, Queen story time. Grab the books, and if you need help, there are book groups. There are so many resources out there, lecture series that are free where you could follow along with your book and interact with that and get an education. Now, you won't get the piece of paper, no. but you'll get an education. And, and for, for a lot of careers, a lot of my kids, a lot of kids go to college because they feel like they have to. There are a lot of kids, particularly boys, who would be very content to work in high paying jobs like carpentry or plumbing. We have way too few of them. You don't need a college degree for that. Get your associate's degree and work. I, pr I promise you this. If your kid works for a two years, a couple of years before he decides on college, stays at home and saves some money, a lot of those kids won't want to go. They'll find that they've, they've interned and got a job or they've picked up a trade or a career that they really like. And you can make money at it. We are really losing uh, qualified tradesmen which is why good ones, good carpenters, good welders, good uh, plumbers, electricians make a lot, a lot of money. And they don't need all of that. You, you only really need a four-year degree right now if you absolutely know for sure what you want to do is something that requires that kind of accreditation. You want to be a doctor or a lawyer one day. Uh, but, and if you think for one second, if you think the kids are falling behind, Oh, if I don't send my kid to college until he's 20. He, no, the average college graduate is 24, 25 years old now. We're, our kids are, are, are staying longer on college, getting more debt, taking them five and six years to get four-year degrees. So your kid doesn't even go to college till he's 20, 21. He'll still finish ahead of a lot of the kids who started at 17 because they can't get through it. All right. Dan from Norman, Oklahoma wants to know, both of you seem like bookworms. Well, he doesn't know you well. You're clearly a farmer. Uh, so what are you currently reading? And what books should I read before I head back to school in September? Hmm. Well, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> this is an open-ended question because we don't know you and we don't know what you like. What? But I'm reading right now a uh, great biography of the uh, Baroque painter Caravaggio. Uh, Graham Dixon's biography of Caravaggio. Fascinating life of a world-changing painter. Uh, great history, great art history, a lot of interesting philosophy there. Graham Dixon's uh, biography of Caravaggio, Michelangelo de Merisi de Caravaggio, great Baroque painter. Is that what he should read too? That's what you should read. He, he didn't tell me, he didn't say, look, I'm well, a sports dude, so what should I read? Well, he, you, he you're said, a book, you, he, just he, great works transcend he, he, everything. Well, I gave, great him, works. I gave him a great suggestion. Let's see what you have to suggest. What well, are you what am I right currently reading? I'm about to start Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> I'm about to start the biography on Mr. Rogers because Tom Hanks will be in the Mr. Rogers movie coming out. I'm about to start that. I just finished a maternity book, so Dan, maybe you probably don't so, need that one. Dan, get knocked up and wear cheesy cardigans or... Study one of the great painters of Western culture. Anyway, Next ben question from Fresno, California says, Dr. Duke, I know you've been a professor and a bartender, bouncer, but what was your first job? Katie, you too. 
My first job was working in a soda fountain of a candy store. <laughs> So I've told you my stories about ultimately becoming a bartender, and I guess my my turn at the soda fountain, making pineapple sundaes and chocolate malts, prepared me for the drunken world of adults and uh, barroom brawling a few years down the road. Did did you have like your apron and the little hat on too? Had an like apron. The old definitely had an apron, and uh, we'd have to wear a hat, a little hat. But definitely, definitely had an nice. apron. The colors of the store were pink and green, wow. which is not a good color combination for anybody. Did you have to be nice to people? Well, I actually was the one making the stuff, so the waitresses had to be nice. I just had to bark out the orders. I became very efficient, though, very assembly line efficient. I believe it. Well, my first job that I got paid for uh, was an official, like, had to file a W-2, was uh, working as a dishwasher and then a salad bar girl. And then, then I was a busser, and I moved my way all the way up to cook's help. So to, to, to summa- summarize, I was a soda jerk, and you were a scullery maid. There we go. That's Outstanding. Basically. But let that, let, let that, from these humble origins, soda go. jerk, scullery maid, mm. we've ascended to this lofty platform. But I must say, because it's a point of pride with me, everyone, if you think about it, from their first job, either quit or got fired. Right? Like ninety nine percent. I did not. The business Look closed down. Oh. So I <laughs> you, you drove well, them to bankruptcy. I drove them, that's what happened. There you go. I was fourteen, okay, a week after my fourteenth birthday. I was Are you working. allowed to work at fourteen? You yes, you were in the state of Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. All right. I was eight back child then, labor laws. Back in the day now, I was. What we learned there are no child labor laws in Wisconsin. Well you can work on a farm at thirteen, so Well that's right. Come work good. And back to farming. Eggs <laughs> which you'll never do. I will never do. I, All right, I well, would be a quick farmer story oh, as we sign off the show. Farmer Duke. I, uh, being a city boy, yes. never had ridden in a pickup truck, pickup truck oh until I was engaged to my um, southern wife. And so went down to Arkansas. I'd never been on a farm before. I'm 30 years old. Oh, my gracious. Never, had never been in a pickup truck, had never been on a farm. 30 years old. And so my father-in-law, future father-in-law, told me to climb into the back of the truck. And I couldn't find a way in the back. In jump the, on the tire. So literally, I, I had to. He was laughing at me because I was trying to climb over the seat because I couldn't figure out how to get in the. It, it's it's literally that was my first impression on my father-in-law. And that I was cr- trying. I was trying. To, I, I I I couldn't figure out how to get into the back seat of a pickup truck. So I was trying to climb over the seat of the front seat to get in the back because I, I didn't realize there was a little door there. And you're the one critiquing me about what I read, but at least I can find my way into the back of a pickup truck. Yeah, I, that's probably how you got pregnant, too. ba ching All right. All right. Well, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. If you want to get in on our, I don't know what even this is called anymore, office hours shenanigans for next month, simply visit freedomproject.com slash askduke and submit your questions there. Again, that's freedomproject.com slash askduke. All right, so let's now wrap everything up with some real education. And thanks to our award-winning Battles of America series, this week we're going to go back to 1775 to look at the famed Battle of Bunker Hill. Enjoy. Battles of America, Bunker Hill. In April of 1775, the Battles of Lexington and Concord ended. The Colonials followed the British back to Boston, Massachusetts, and laid siege on the city with a low supply of cannons, firearms, and artillery. Recognizing the need to control access to Boston Harbor, the British planned to occupy Bunker Hill and Breed's Hill. After catching wind of the British plan, 1,200 colonials under the command of William Prescott rushed to the hills and built fortifications during the night. On the morning of June 17, 1775, the British awoke to find the colonials already occupying the hills. The British forces, confident in their superior training and equipment, expected to take the hills with relative ease. Led by Commander William Howe, the British dispatched 2,400 troops toward Breed's Hill. As the Colonials were preparing for battle, Dr. Joseph Warren joined the fight and was given command of the troops. However, he turned it down and fought alongside the others, as to him, it was a privilege to serve under General Prescott. Because of the shortage of ammunition, the Colonial Militia was given the famous order, hold your fire until you see the whites of their eyes, in order to maximize British casualties. The resourceful colonials thwarted the first two British assaults, inflicting significant casualties on the Redcoats. However, now depleted of ammunition, the Americans were forced to retreat during the third onslaught, giving the British a tactical victory. While the Americans sustained a fair amount of casualties, including Dr. Joseph Warren, the British amassed thousands of casualties, which sent a clear message that the colonial militia was a force to be reckoned with. 
Despite the technical victory for the British, the conflict seemed more like a defeat. Almost half of their soldiers on that day were killed or wounded. The Battle of Bunker Hill, actually fought mainly on Breed's Hill, greatly boosted the confidence of the undertrained and poorly supplied American forces. Despite being outnumbered, the Americans stood up to the best the British had to offer and lived to fight another day. The promise of independence and liberty remained alive and well, sustained and bolstered by the victory at Bunker Hill. And there you go. Next week, we're going to be debuting a brand new episode of our Heroes of the West series featuring Jan Sobieski. Now, make sure to share this podcast with at least two of your friends. And if you want to go crazy, make it three of your friends. That's your homework for this week. And that does it for us this week on the Dr. Duke Show, Freedom Project. I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. See you next time.